Okay, guys, I feel a bit better, so I think I can handle recording this second half, but definitely excuse my voice, because I am not 100% there yet. Now, on part one of our half-elf video, we talked about the different kinds of half-elves, the half-sea elves, the half-drow, and of course, the standard half-elf that you are used to seeing. We talked about how populous half-elves are in the world, their demographics in the different kingdoms of the world, and we started talking about what has effectively become something of a racial capital for them in the world. Uh, we still have a lot to go through though because this is a enormous topic that deserves a lot of time invested on it, so uh, strap in for this one. People love half-elves, so I wanted to make sure to give you guys as much information as I could on it. Now, there's no reason to dilly-dally too much here, let's get right into it. For those of you who don't know, I have an online store where I make and sell Dungeons & Dragons PDFs to supplement your games. It's MrRex.store, and in there you can find a bunch of stuff from adventures to new 5th edition classes to lore-based game accessories to even entire modifications to the way 5th edition functions. In Armor Redesigned, I went and remade the way AC functions in D&D in order to include one of my favorite RPG concepts, damage reduction. Armor should mitigate the damage that you take, and the stronger your armor, the less damage that you should take from attacks. Doesn't it bother you that players or even monsters can sometimes have like 25 AC, making them basically unhittable? It can be so unimmersive when an enormous purple worm makes a cataclysmic bite attack against a slow and unmoving fighter in full plate, only to just miss. In Armor Redesigned, I added damage reduction to the game, I, I rebalanced all of the armors in 5th edition so that even padded armor was useful, made it so that magical weapons that dealt extra damage don't just completely break the game, added multiple tables to help you understand how much damage reduction monsters should have, how much money players should be able to spend on armor per level, what is the expected amount of power players should have per level with magical weapons, and even added an entire section with exotic types of armor. Now you can craft adamantine, carapace, draconic, mithril, oricalcum, silver, and telxten armor, and even more. All of it with their prices, their effects, and even lore associated with each of the exotic materials. Now please go ahead and check out my armor redesigned PDF and my other content there as well at MrRax.store. Everything here, with the exception of the adventure, was written by me. I put a lot of effort in all of this stuff and all of this content in hopes that it'll make your 5th edition experience better. So if you want to support the channel, uh, there is no better way than checking out my store and see if you like something. MrRax.store. Thank you guys so much. Now, back to the video. Aglaron has the only location in the entire world where you have a civilization exclusively comprised of half-elves. A civilization that has been flourishing and growing for thousands of years, which has given birth to something of a half-elven culture, the only of its kind in Faerun. This group of half-elves live in the Eurwood and are descendants of green elves that stayed behind in the forest when the humans started expanding onto the peninsula. The forest used to have star elves, but but those left to a demiplane dimension rather than deal with those humans. Now, the southern part of Aglarond is mostly deserted, and it is not suitable for life because of all of the monsters that live there. It is also relatively dangerous as much fighting happens there with Aglarond's enemies, which we will cover in just a bit. The north side is where most of the humans live, in port cities scattered across the coast. These cities are mostly all human, but with a healthy minority of urban half-elves that keep the peace between the cities and the nomadic half elves of the forest. Okay, so now who are those Aglaron's enemies? Well, you may have noticed, but Aglaron is awfully close to Thay. Aglaron is one of Thay's greatest enemies actually. To give you some context, if a country could be a villain, then Thay would be one of the greater villains in the Forgotten Realms. And so it is interesting to note that it is in fact this kingdom that helps keep Thay at bay and prevent them from further expanding into the west. And this is of course with a lot of help from the massive half-elf civilization that thrives here. In particular, in the big battlegrounds that form on the southern sections of the Eurwood. Uh, this here, Glorandar, is a massive fortress and they have constructed uh, some 
something of a Wall of China type of approach that stretches from the fortress all the way towards the mountain, making this Great Wall about 15 miles long. Uh, the threat coming from Thay has actually been one of the greatest factors in keeping the peace between the half-elves of the Yurwood and the humans of the port towns, as they have to work together to have any chance at fighting such a powerful Thayan force. Uh, this thankfully does allow for the half-elf realm of the Yurwood to continue to grow and thrive. But let's go a bit deeper into the Yurwood and talk about the half-elves there, since that is what this video is all about, it's what you guys are interested in. Quote, Aglarondin half-elves descended from humans and wild elves, have coppery skin, sometimes with a greenish tinge, with black or blonde hair. Their ears show a subtle elven point and their eyes tend to be gold-flecked and wise. Aglarondin of both races are stoic by nature and harbor a deep love for the woods and shores of the peninsula. Most take any chance they can get to hike or travel along the rocky coast or the eaves of the Yurwood, although few without elven blood find the forest depths comforting. Aglaron's half-elves include both wary foresters living as simple nomadic hunters in the heart of the Yurwood and cosmopolitan city dwellers living alongside humans in short side towns. Most fall somewhere between these two extremes. They live under the forest canopy but are schooled in the ways of the outside world. They treasure their own culture while recognizing those of others. They participate in governing their nation because if they fail to moderate the commerce and expansion of the human neighbors, open strife between the races may one day return to Aglarond." End quote. In terms of economy, the half-elves that live within the Yurwood are not interested as much in the coinage produced by the urban cities of the north. However, they do participate somewhat in trade, though mostly in the form of bartering. This is typically by giving the port cities much of the wood that naturally falls in and around the Yurwood. These fallen trees are picked up by the half-elves and then transported. Another big source of trade between the two is blood wine, which is made inside of the Yurwood and is somewhat world famous and uh, also somewhat mysterious. The actual process for how to create it is mostly unknown, but rumors say that it is made from the shriveled grapes that fall off of the vines which are possessed by evil spirits. Uh, regardless of how it is made though, uh, blood wine is super famous and you can probably find it in many places within Faerun. But now, inside of the Yurwood, most of the half-elves are nomadic, which means that they will form a settlement in a suitable location, only to then dismantle it within a season or two to move to a different area. Uh, they only have very simple set of laws in their settlements and they're mostly about violence to person and property. Everything else is basically decided by common sense rulings. Uh, the the politics of Aglarond in general are fairly complex but also kind of simple in the sense that uh, typically laws are governed by the individual communities but it is also complex because there is an overall council that governs the entire kingdom and even the half-elves of the Yurwood are subject to that council but in practice everyone just sort of governs themselves. These are very individualistic type of people. The half-elves of the Yurwood do have of course many representatives in the council which is what keeps the peace. Further, you have, or I guess had, the symbol. The symbol, as of 3rd edition, was the Queen of Aglaron, and was really the reason why the kingdom managed to fight off Thay so effectively. The symbol is one of the famous Seven Sisters. She is known as the Witch Queen of Aglaron, and is one of the most powerful spellcasters in the world. She's actually supposedly the wife or lover of Elminster. And she's a challenge rating 36 spellcaster, so kind of a big deal. Anyways, having someone this powerful as the queen, of course, as you can imagine, helps maintain the peace between the elves and the humans. But now, in terms of locations within the Yurwood, uh, there is one that is somewhat permanent and not a settlement that gets removed every season. In fact, uh, this would probably be the closest to what you might call the capital of the half-elves in Faerun. It is called Relcat's Foot. Quote, this is the largest settlement of the half-elves in the Yurwood. To many of the locals, those who believe in such civilized things as cities, 
This is the capital of the Eurowood, much as Vilprintaler is the capital of the encompassing nation of Aglaron. Rilkat's foot is built around four tall, majestic trees that rise more than 100 feet out of the forest thick canopy into the open light. These are said to have sprung from the buried foot of an ancient god, Relkath of the Numberless Branches. Relkath, along with other mysterious powers who predate the elves, is said to be sleeping beneath the forest soil, some day to awaken when the people of the Eurowood need their ancient gods again. Many inhabitants of Relkat's foot live on the ground, constantly on the lookout for invaders or strangers of any kind. The rest make their homes on wooden platforms in the massive trees and the surrounding forest, all strung together by a complex network of ropes and suspension bridges. Outsiders are rarely permitted in the boughs of the trees. A merchant square is set up on the ground near the four trees, and a pair of inns flank the town to the north and south. Travelers are welcome as long as they respect the natives and their way of life. Rilkat's Foot is more a center of barter, celebration, and lore keeping than of commerce and industry. The local hunters bring their game and furs here to sell, usually bartering for needed goods rather than hoarding the symbol's coinage. Many skilled woodworkers, including some of the kingdom's finest bowers uh, keep workshops in and around the town. The masters of the Eurowood have their headquarters here. Just outside the city stands a manier circle portal that leads directly to the Sunglade. From there, the masters can reach anywhere else in the forest in less than a day. The rangers of Relkat's foot, many of whom are masters of the Eurowood, are legendary. Human rangers from all over Faroon journey here to learn from these seasoned foresters. End quote. Okay, so to explain some of that, so the ancient star elves that used to live here in the Eurowood, they created a lot of portals in the forest. In fact, they enchanted the forest with all kinds of magical effects. The entire forest is actually completely impenetrable by divination magic, which is the reason why the Theans have had such difficulty trying to fight the half elves in here. But anyways, uh, the forest is filled with man ears, which hold secret passages and magical runes, which allow one that knows how to interpret them to teleport in and around the forest. It is said that there are even portals that connect to Evermeet. The half-elves have a group of very knowledgeable druids and rangers which understand these runes and keep its lore for prosperity and those we call the masters. But yeah, these meniers or standing stones are scattered all across the woods and they are meant to be the centerpiece of a massive connection of magical anchors, so to speak. The original Star Elves, they used these maniers as a focus for their magic in order to create a great portal into that demiplane that they now inhabit. These Star Elves, however, are currently at war with a mysterious set of alien monsters and are losing. So the lore does state that the Star Elves are considering potentially either returning to the Eurowood or asking the Half Elves for help. And according to the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, it seems that the Star Elves have actually returned to the Eurowood as of the present day, presumably because they probably lost that magical war, though we don't have any more information about this. This could, of course, have massive implications since the Star Elves have been alive since the founding time, an ancient era thousands of years old. But alas, we don't really know much about them yet, though it might be safe to assume that as of the present day, there's probably a massive war in Aglarond between all of these elves, the half-elves, and this ancient race of mysterious abominations. But yeah, since we don't know, I gotta leave it there. As far as the main congregation of half-elves in the world, Aglarond is where that would be. But now, moving on to a different topic, why aren't there any more half-elves? I mean, there are a lot of humans, and there used to be a fair amount of elves, and you would imagine that half-elves would reproduce with one another and create more, no? Well, yeah, that is true. But the problem is just how fast humans reproduce, which just inherently screws over basically every other species. See, every species in D&D have, like, a thing that makes them special. If every species was blessed by their creator with a thing, then the human's thing is that they are really good at reproducing. So you may have wondered, why half-elves? Why specifically half-elves? 
Why not half human, half dwarf? Why not half dwarf, half elf? What about the combinations that can come up from halflings and elves, or elves and gnomes? Why is there such a focus on specifically the union between humans and elves? So, multiple reasons. One is that, frankly, species other than humans, and orcs really for that matter, are just really bad at reproducing. <laughs> Half dwarf, half elves do exist. Funnily enough, they are canonically called dwelves. And there are a few that have come out in novels and stories within the Forgotten Realms history, but they are so unbelievably rare that they are just a non factor, really. Dwarves in particular suffer from fairly serious fertility issues. For example, and, and listen closely to this, only 55% of dwarves are fertile. On top of that, 70% of all dwarf births are male, so only one out of three dwarf babies is born a female, which of course compounds the problem since only half of those females will be able to reproduce. In other words, 50% of humans can get pregnant, whereas only 15% of dwarves can get pregnant. I don't believe we have statistics like these for the other species, and it is likely that they are not that bad, but they are probably not that far off either. In general, the lore of the Forgotten Realms makes it extremely clear that the reproductive speed of humans is unlike anything else that exists in the world, and again, with the exception of the orcs, which also have that same reproductive strength as humans do. It's funny in a sad way, I suppose, that the lore for the dwarves even states that there are many dwarves that literally will try and find humans to reproduce with because it is just frankly a lot easier to reproduce with humans than it is to reproduce within their own kind. Now, you might be wondering, okay, well, if that's true, then where are all of those half-human, half-dwarves? Are they as common as the half-humans, half-elves? Well, yes and no. The thing is, the dwarvish blood is very potent. And whatever these guys are made out of, it is some really dense stuff. Basically, when a human and a dwarf mate, what comes out is a half-dwarf, of course, but half-dwarves are literally just dwarves. The lore states that there is no functional difference between a full-blooded dwarf and a half-dwarf. They look just like dwarves, they behave just like dwarves, have the same biological imperative as dwarves, are treated as dwarves by the communities and even deities, and have the same magical effects that are natural to the biology of dwarves. And they do not get any of the typical boons that the human blood normally provides, such as adaptability and such. The only difference really between a full dwarf and a half dwarf is basically that the half dwarf is just a bit taller and that's 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 it in fact every time that you go out an adventure and find a dwarf out there it is possible that you're actually interacting with a half dwarf and you would never be able to tell in fact not even the dwarf itself might know if it didn't know its parents further if that half dwarf then mate with a full-blooded dwarf then the resulting union would produce a full-blooded dwarf. And if the half-dwarf mates with another half-dwarf or any other species, then you would just simply continue to get half-dwarves. Just again, they would just look like dwarves anyways. In other words, if you were wondering, okay, we have half-elves, why don't we have half-dwarves? Well, that is because half-dwarves don't really exist in the same way that half-elves exist. They are literally just dwarves. On the plus side, though, it is the fact that humans are able to produce dwarves in this way that has unironically helped them out so much in maintaining a decent population size within the Savage Frontier. Things get a bit more obscure with the other species because, frankly, we just don't have that much information. Uh, there is a write-up in Dragon Magazine number 59 by Roger Moore, who worked for TSR, the company that came before Wizards of the Coast. They owned this publication, Dragon Magazine, so there is a strong level of canonicity to this, but it is not strictly Forgotten Realms canon. In any case, in the write-up, it said, quote, Depending on the makeup of the nearest town, the population of a halfling community will include varieties of halflings that resemble their non-halfling neighbors. Hare feet live near men, have no infravision, and reside in small cottages. Tall fellows live in forests and have infravision like elves, as well as being more lithe and elven in appearance. Stouts are shorter than hare feet, live in caves and tunnel complexes, and have infravision. 
and they can detect slopes and other underground features in a fashion similar to dwarves. Some of these similarities are probably due to imitation and the effects of the environment. However, there is always the possibility of an occasional cross-marriage and subsequent mixing of the gene pool. Cross-racial marriages are quite rare in halfling society, but have been known to occur. Very little is said or heard about them, though. End quote. This is, of course, further compounded by the entry in the 5th edition player's handbook that states that stout halflings are rumored to have dwarvish blood. So anyways, as far as halflings go, I'm actually not sure because I don't think we have a canon ruling on whether humans and halflings can truly mate or what happens when they do. At least that's what I would have normally said if it wasn't for Ed Greenwood himself responding to my tweet where I was asking the community for help on any information that they could find on halfling reproduction. Ed Greenwood, creator of the Forgotten Realms, said, quote, Thanks to the Code of Conduct, you won't find much in print on cross-species fertility beyond Gary Gagak's writings in Dragon. However, it's been said by TSR staffers at many Gen Con panels that halflings are almost as fecund as orcs and cross-fertile with most species, often imparting their height and their durability slash hardiness. Halflings dwell in large numbers in most human cities in the realms, and human hin marriages, unions, and offspring are numerous. Most offspring favor one parent or the other, and human genes seem to win out over halfling in this superficial appearance, height mainly contest." End quote. So what I am gathering from this is that it is likely that much like with the half-dwarves, you're probably seeing a lot of half-halflings, or, or I guess quarterlings as the internet has amusingly called them, but they just simply look like humans from a visual level with perhaps some small halfling features like, I don't know, hairy feet for example. Ed Greenwood also commented, quote, The general rule in the realms has always been that in any cross-species union, a particular family of offspring will favor one parent species over the other, at least visually." End quote. So this again further confirms why you don't notice half-dwarves or seemingly half-halflings, just that they simply look like dwarves and humans respectively. I asked a series of similar questions to Ed Greenwood relating to gnomes, and he responded with this, quote, Gnomes don't have a fertility problem like the dwarves did before the Thunder Blessing. So, so the race has problems, I think he meant doesn't have problems replacing its battle and old age losses. And gnomes have a cultural tendency. They prefer long deepening friendships and courtships. Then when they do wed small families so they can devote themselves to their children so one or two children. They also have a quiet, keep to themselves, low public profile tendency, whether it's when dwelling in human-dominated cities, where they tend to be cellar workers as masons and delvers and as cargo loaders and unloaders and kitchen and pantry workers, and when crofting in the wild, farms dominated by mushrooms and root vegetable caves. In other words, they often get overlooked, so gnomes are quite numerous, just not noticed. They also have recessive genes. When a gnome mates with a dwarf, the offspring will almost always look like a dwarf. When they mate with halflings, the offspring almost always look like halflings. And when gnomes mate with humans, the offspring almost always look like humans. And for look like, read can pass four. So gnomes are everywhere, but often go unnoticed." End quote. So what's interesting about this is that this simultaneously explains why we don't see many gnomes around, because their genes are very recessive and any cross-mingling will basically erase them, but also explains why it seemed as if they basically didn't exist in the census and demographics which we covered on part one of this video. In the demographics we covered prior, if a species population numbered less than 1% in any particular region, it basically went uncounted. So if gnomes existed in many different regions, but at below that 1% margin, it is still possible for them to be fairly numerous, but effectively invisible at the meta level. In any case, yeah. That is why you don't see half gnomes walking around. Now, compare all that with humans and elves. Elves typically reproduce extremely slow, taking a long time to produce a child, and of course, that child takes 100 years to reach adulthood, which means uh, parents can't really afford to have many of them. 
However, when an elf mates with a human, the human seed seems to exponentially increase the likelihood of children and the child grows really fast, letting parents simply have more. Further, elves and humans are simply more likely to become romantically entangled. Humans tend to be attracted to the artistic and magical nature of elves, plus they are refined, elegant, and mysterious, but also good-natured and kind. And that's all very attractive to a human. And many elves tend to admire the zest for life that humans have, the ambition and desire for fun and adventure. See. Uh, all elves typically go through a fairly long period of uh, what we will call rebellion. Elves, before they reach maturity at the age of 100, they are biologically inclined to seek fun and opportunities and explore the world. They generally eschew the slow and reserved attitude of their culture in favor of adventure and experiences. Then, when they reach adulthood, that's when they calm down, settle down, and become the more mysterious and aloof and, I guess, serious type of elf that you might be more accustomed to. Anyhow, it is during these crazy years, as we call them, that the elves just find humans fascinating because they are that which they currently are seeking. You know, wild, adventurous, fast-paced, exciting, and so, yeah, many elves end up reproducing with humans during these years, which creates then, of course, half-elves. In conclusion, uh, that is why you see a ton of half-elves and why half-elves are so big within the Forgotten Realms world and why you don't see half dwarves or half halflings or half gnomes. Half orcs and orcs, of course, as we've talked about a lot before, are a bit different because in the Forgotten Realms, orcs are literally monsters. Uh, these are not meant to be like the orcs from, say, Elder Scrolls. You know, like a species that is basically just like a green-skinned human with tusks or something. And here, orcs are like the Tolkien orcs. They, they look like monsters. They are inherently evil and destroy everything within their path. So half orcs overwhelmingly just come from enslavement and domination, with an incredibly small amount that would come from the rare consensual intermingling. But yeah, much like how humans have that almost magical ability to successfully reproduce with any species, orcs do have that as well, and there are many half-orcs variants out in the world. Ogrelins, for example, are half-orc, half-ogre. Boogans are half-orc, half-quagath. Tanaruks are half-orc, half-fiends, etc, etc. Though it is worth noting that the union between orc and elf is one of the few things that is explicitly said in the lore that it's just not possible. Uh, nothing comes out of that union, probably based on the enmity that Corlin Larethian, the god of the elves, and Grumsh, the god of the orcs, half between each other. They just hate each other. They are arch nemesis to each other. So it seems like this hatred has somehow magically prevented these unions from manifesting. Now to end the video, all that is left for you to know is that you typically get a half elf when you have obviously a human and an elvish parent. But if that half elf offspring were to then reproduce with another human, you would still get a half elf. But if then that half elf offspring were to reproduce with another human, that's when you would get a human offspring. In other words, uh, elvish blood seems to dilute within two generations. So for you to be a half-elf, you must either have two half-elf parents, or one full-blood elf parent, or one full-blood elf grandparent. Provided that any of these are true, you will be a half-elf. The same appears to hold true the other way around. According to the second edition Forgotten Realms campaign setting, a half-elf that breeds with a full-blood elf will eventually produce a full-blood elf. This campaign setting says that it takes only one generation, whereas the third edition campaign setting suggests that it takes two generations, but you do with that what you will. But yeah, we will leave it there since this video is uh, already too long. There are some intricacies as to how half-elves are treated when they grow in human or elvish societies respectively, but most of that I think is covered just really well in the 5th edition player's handbook. To summarize it though, half-elves struggle quite a lot in elvish societies because they mature really quickly. By the time a half-elf is 15 years of age, it starts to notice that its peers still behave like children because a 15-year-old elf is very much 
a child in mentality. And so most of them do end up leaving Elvish communities because they just find it impossible to relate to anybody. Plus, uh, the Elvish culture does promote that idea that elves' uh, children should go out and explore before they become adults. So most elves will not necessarily even oppose a half-elf leaving their home to see how things are out there. Otherwise, though, half-elves do tend to be ostracized more often in Elvish communities, especially those that exist in isolated locations. Elves, uh, generally speaking, uh, do tend to be more bigoted towards humans than humans are to elves. So half-elves take a pretty heavy toll when growing up in these communities. Uh, further, when it comes to religion, uh, status within the settlement and responsibilities and all of that stuff, half-elves are usually not considered elves by the elves, but something different, something perhaps even lesser in some ways. And so most half-elves feel like they are basically second-class citizens in elvish communities, even when elves are not meaning to make it so. On the other hand, a half-elf that grows in a human community has a much more easier time, at least once they are an adult. A childhood in a human settlement is still pretty awkward because humans do grow a bit faster, they mature faster, and generally have more rough, I guess more physical upbringings. See, human children, we, we learn by mistakes. You know how it is, you run until you fall, because that teaches you not to run. Uh, human children tend to play rough, they climb dangerous trees, they get lost out in the woods, they, they fight between each other, they get jealous and scream when they want something. Elvish children are not like that. They are a lot more composed, they are a lot more calm, but also sensitive and less prone to rough play. Similar things happen to half-elf children where they don't really want to play rough, they don't want to play sports. They instead may enjoy drawing more often or walking peacefully. A half-elf child might probably enjoy more story time for a lot longer than human children who might get bored of such activities once they reach a certain age. Because of all these things, it is far more likely for human children to bully that have elven children since they find them easy targets who likely will not fight back and will instead become submissive to the bullies. This can of course create trauma, which is one of the reasons why most half-elves tend to be loners that, that prefer living outside of big settlements. They typically dislike big congregations of people and prefer to be on their own instead. This is why half-elves have a hard time in human societies, though again, this is generally just for childhood. Once a half-elf grows into an adult, they find that human society is far better and more conducive to a proper and good life especially more so when compared to an elvish society. Thank you guys so much for watching. And again, I apologize for the delay on the upload. I just got sick, so I couldn't record uh, this section of the video. But at least I hope that you guys are happy that you got a lot of stuff relating to species interbreeding, which I felt was super interesting. Uh, the scripts for the last three videos that relate to the Forgotten Realms timeline are already made, so I'm hoping to be able to release them promptly. And after that, we will go back to doing dragons, which I know you guys really enjoyed. Uh, do please, if you can, uh, check out my store, mrrex.store, where all of my PDFs are located. Uh, what I don't tell you about Dragon Hordes was my very first one, the first one that I ever made, so the layout is not as clean as my new ones, but I put in so much awesome content in there, it's insane. I, I went back and collected all the lore that I could find on anything that related to looting dragons. So in the PDF, I have information on what you can do with dragon brains, dragon bones, uh, the rituals that you can do by utilizing dragon blood, uh, what happens when you drink dragon blood. I have a lot of draconic based spells from older editions that I remade into 5th edition, tons of magic items, uh, three different subclasses relating to either dragons or massive creatures. There's just so much content in there. I have even went in deep about how many scales you can get from dragons and how much it would cost you to make a draconic scale mail. It's all in there. MrRex.store, please check it out. Anything that you can purchase in there directly supports the channel and allows me to keep doing this awesome content for you guys. Thank you all so much and I will see you all next time.